Hello everyone, welcome to this special edition of the party party coverage of the European elections of 2024. As you can see by the logos behind me, we are currently at the headquarters of the Alliance of Liberals and Democrats for Europe Party, uh, here in Brussels known as the Alde Party. And we are hosted by the man himself, uh, the Secretary General of the Alde Party, Diedrich de Schatzen. Uh, we are going to talk to him about the importance of the European political parties in the ongoing campaign uh, and the role of parties in democracy in general, why they are losing on popularity and how we can fix that as media and society. So Diedrich has been working for the Alde Party for almost 13 years and uh, as of recently he has assumed the position of Secretary General and I want to know what today in the life of a Secretary General of the European Party looks like. So if you could share the first thing you do when you come to the office, what is it? How do people know you are in the office? Well, it's, it's, it's very varied. Huh? It's, um, it involves an element of, of management of the organization. We're a uh, small but very diverse team of, uh, of about a little less than 30 staffers from, if I'm not wrong, at least more than 30 nationalities, because some people combine several languages. With, with people that are at the beginning of the career, people that have been there for a while. So there's the organizational management, which takes one. There is a dimension of representation, uh, where you have to represent the organization, either to member parties or, or in events like this, which, which I, I truly enjoy. And then there should be some time for, for strategic reflections. A lot of people are, are working with, with operations and, and, and delivering directly, but one, one has to be the one thinking a little bit further ahead. So it makes the job very diverse. It makes it much more difficult than any other positions, though, to disconnect. I find that very tricky. Uh, you know how people say that for the health of, of work-life balance, you should disconnect. And, and that's for now a bit tricky for me, but I'll, I'm sure I'll get better at it. What is the first thing you do when you come to the office? I think my day really starts with playbook. Huh? It's, a co it's a commercial for Politico, but it really is. I drop my kids off at the bus at 7.30, and at 7.32 is when I read my playbook. And, and uh, I try to greet my colleagues in the morning. I don't think I'm, I'm that good, but uh, I, I think I immediately dive in uh, uh, through my emails and, and tasks to do. Uh, uh. So they don't know that Dietrich is here when you come to the office? No, and especially... Before we're you order them. <laughs> <something>. <laughs> exactly, exactly. We're, we're on two floors, so, so it's difficult to know where I am if I'm on the second or the sixth floor. So we keep that suspense a bit. The silent leadership, so exactly. to say. Uh, you've been with the Alder Party for a long time, for, I, I believe, uh, 13 years. Uh, and um, we can maybe conclude that you like working in a political party, in a European political party. I personally can understand why. It's a diverse environment. Um, you can get to work around Europe, uh, on the European level, on the national levels, collaborating with the parties. But uh, a lot of people are not that trustworthy of parties these days. Uh, what is the one thing you love the most about working in a political party or in, in a political party, of a political party in general? What is the one thing you would like people to know what parties are like? What really keeps me motivated, if I can formulate it, or what makes it the most exciting is that I, I, I fall politically in love with some profiles. Uh, uh, from, from profiles like Margrethe Vestager, Karakelas, Xavier Bettel, Marc Rutte, the crowd, these are people that, in the essence, at one point every job gets a bit annoying. When mine is more administrative boring, I still say that this is my small contribution to get some of these profiles, some of these Vera Jourovas, some of these uh, 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 Kadri Simpsons to, to, to help them with their work. And that is what really keeps you motivated. And yes, political parties are imperfect in, in a lot of ways. But it is currently one of the, the, the best functioning systems if you want to change things. And it is imperfect with, in a lot of ways, and I'm sure we'll discuss it. But there are many ways to change the world, to change your environment, uh, many different ways. Politics is one of them. And, and, and then if it's politics, then I fear we need political parties to structure all these great motivation to change. So it is about the people for you. Yes. And ultimately, politics should always be about the yes. people. And you've mentioned some 
amazing names. You've recently launched uh, as well your campaign and yeah. you have a Spitzenkandidaten from uh, Germany working together with the other candidates from the Renew Europe group. Um, how do you feel uh, about this theme? Is it a mm. winning theme for you? Uh, what is the main leading emotion behind choosing these diverse people, so to say? And what are your expectations of that theme? So that's three questions in one. Huh? Um, you mentioned I've nearly been here uh, uh, 13 years. I think in May will be my, my 13th uh, work anniversary. Meaning that I've seen these three European campaigns from very close hand. I've been, which is, uh, I'm a liberal. I normally like change and freedom. Ironically here for European campaigns, it's not a bad thing to have been there and to see the different scape, what, scope of these campaigns. What's really important to know is that our political family is in it a little bit differently than the other ones. If we were the biggest European political family uh, uh, really applying for a job of presidency of the commission, then that's one thing. For us, it's different. Our main goal was to say that we're willing to campaign, that we have people in power that can do it, and to find a format where we can defend our ideas. And, and so that is our buy-in. So, so uh, if you... If you're thinking conservative or socialists, then you might think, well, what is it with a team of three, etc. If you're thinking with a concept of we want to show we have profiles that can govern, we have IDs, and we are diverse from Germany, France, Italy. Uh, 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 2019, we even had somebody from Copenhagen, somebody from Rome, somebody from Spain, some Friday from Budapest, somebody from Ghent, and some Friday from Berlin. It is, again, uh, not a perfect system. But we have formats like Eurovision. You all know the Eurovision Music Contest. Well, we have a Eurovision debate where you have these profiles that show what they are fighting for and also enlighten and show some of their differences. It's a good way to get people to motivate the, mm -hmm. the analogy with Eurovision, mm -hmm. yeah. especially in this time of the year. Um, so I, I, I wish you all the best with that, with that uh, part of the campaign as well. Um, I know you have a background in communications yep. and you've been managing the, the comms and events team here for a long while. And I feel like a lot of the political debates and a lot of the campaigning has been transferred to the digital space yep. right now. So in your opinion, how much of it has transferred to the digital space? Are we losing the human touch? Mm. Uh, and what is currently the main element of your campaign? Is it the digital part or the, you know, the, the yep. direct contact, so to say? The, the European campaign as such, I sometimes joke around, it says it's a campaign that doesn't exist because I'm running a campaign where you cannot vote directly for me. You can vote for member parties. So obviously the European campaign is very digital because we don't have that many alternatives. However, you, you have to see the bid as an opportunity because I have, a, a, I have three daughters and, and, and one is 14, the other one is 16. So they're already on, 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 on TikTok, obviously. And, and so we have a scope there of an audience that we had difficulties to reach before. And, and I think it comes with challenges and it comes with advantages like many things in life. Um, so at the European level, obviously, we are going very, very much so on, on the, the digital sphere because that's the only way we can do it. At national, it's still successful to go on markets to meet the people. And it's not only to get votes. It's also to get good feedback because we criticized political parties too uh, uh, a little bit before. But what is the biggest risk I find in organization is, is, uh, is guessing. That's the worst thing that happens with politicians is when they think that this might be a good idea or not. And you have to prove that either with data, but the best is with reaching out to, to people that you wouldn't talk to individually. And it makes you, of course, it helps to be elected, but it also really helps you to test your ideas. Um, and that is why, yes, European campaign is now much more digital, but there's still really value for the one-on-one -on -one -on -one contacts. And um, uh, maybe there is a compromise. I'm Belgian, uh, nobody's perfect, but there is even using the digital sphere and to be as, as uh, authentic as you can and promote exchange. And some of these Google Hangouts, some of these uh, uh, YouTube lives uh, uh, can really be uh, very interactive. And that is probably the compromise uh, and the compromise solution. So basically in the headquarters of the European, European Party, uh, you coordinate the national campaigns, so to say. And I just remembered uh, the other day I was talking to a friend from Croatia 
And uh, he was, I was asking him, are you ready for the European elections? Mm. Are you going to vote? And they're like, oh, I don't know, you know, uh, what is the point? Everything is chosen by me, the European institutions, mm. the Brussels. It is not the choice of the people. And then he said one thing. Um, also, the European Parliament, it's, it's not elected by the people. And I was very surprised. And I personally come from Bosnia and Herzegovina, mm. so I don't vote in the European elections. But I know that the parliament is directly elected. And I tried to explain that mm. to him. And he was actually surprised to learn that. And he said he's going to, to vote at the European mm. election. Uh, it changed his mind. Do you feel that the European parties also have this responsibility to not jo just co uh, communicate their campaign? but also to communicate the importance of the European elections, of the European Union in general, and to kind of bring this a bit closer to the people on the ground in the member states of what the Union is about and why it matters, especially in this current uh, geopolitical context. Well, the, the answer is yes and no. Is, is yes, uh, uh, well, first of all, no. I don't think it's really a role to do it, but yes, we have to do it because it's not done sufficiently. Uh, in an ideal world, people should be aware, it should be either through civic courses nationally, be explained, or the parliament has, an has a role to explain a bit how elections are going. But, but uh, so ideally, no. In practice, yes, we have to, and it is really important. And it is complex. I joked around, I had a, a, a debate at one point, and I said uh, I can joke around and explain the Belgian political system in a minute uh, as a party trick. Uh, uh, which is not easy, but um, I cannot explain the co-decision system in, in a minute. Um, I take again the example of my daughter at one point when she, um, she did a simulation of the Council uh, uh, of the EU. And when she met somebody from the Council of Europe, she said, hey, I did the Council. And then she was to explain that the Council of Europe has nothing to do with the European Council, that has nothing to do with the Council of the EU. And then you're a little bit like, we're really trying to make it complicated there. And, and, and when you have interested young people that want to understand, and, and the level of complexity is so strong, and, and, and that is something where I really would like people to be a bit more frustrated about, and to say, look, guys, figure it out. Huh? If, uh, change your name, call it European Summit, people will get it much more. And, and that is part of the, of the complexity of having to explain things, and, and unfortunately, we have to. Um, but yes, you are electing European parliamentarians directly. Uh, and also turnout is not that bad. In 2019, I, I, I lied. I don't do that often, but I said that the first thing I would do after the election is to look at the voting turnout, and then I'll look at the results. Now, turnout, I was a bit too stressed, and I did look at the results first. But the second thing I immediately looked at was voting turnout. And you can blame or be uh, pessimistic. It's not in our nature. But the reality is, is that for the last two terms, the curve of, of voting attendance has not been going down, stabilized. In 2019, until 2 in the morning, we had even raised of, I think, 1%. It was a little bit viewed lower. I think it's 0 0.8 at the end. But we are, uh, the voting turnout is, is decent. It's quite, I'd love it to be much more. But there is interest. And I feel quite comfortable the voting turnout will be important now. So to not make the same mistake as 2019, on election night, I will first look at our results, but immediately after, I will check out what the voting turnout is because that really, really matters to me. You expect it to be higher this year? Yes, uh, I, I think it is looking like we'll go for a small increase yeah, in, in voting turnout. Sense. It makes sense, especially uh, talking to about the digital context mm -hmm. and also the geopolitical context. I feel like people um, have a, a bigger sense of unity right now in Europe. I mean, so. the, the, the vaccines helped. Huh? People realized, uh, I, I, and that I find very elegant, I mentioned Kaya Kalas before, but she had calculated based on her market share, and she said if I wouldn't have had the European Union, I would have had to wait for my vaccine until 2024 uh, uh, with, with that small population. So, and I think there people realized that that cooperation worked. Uh, uh, on Ukraine, I think everybody realizes that uh, the view of uh, just uh, Latvia itself or Luxembourg or Belgium for the matter is not going to help. We have to unite. So I hope that this is going to motivate people to see that it matters. Uh, uh, you like it or you don't like it, that's something different. But it's not insignificant. And then sometimes when people say, yes, but locally there's so, such a better turnout, I don't think that's going to change. You have to set your goals right. Yes, I think you're going to have more people voting uh, uh, locally uh, because they know what it matters and the road. It's much easier to understand. And you will maybe have some more people voting at the presidential of their country. 
uh, 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 but if your objective is to to have more than half, that is something that is, I think, really important and, and uh, uh, that I hope we will achieve. I hope so too. But, you know, in addition to the unity, there is still some you know, Euroscepticism. Yes. Um, there is still some polarization around Europe, around different topics. And you come from a party that is known to bridge bridges, both within the group, mm. uh, of, of around different views. Yep. So how do you see the, the role of the ALDE party in overcoming these type of challenges, in countering the narratives of, of Euroskeptics? We're not very good at it. Uh, I don't have 15, 20 examples to show you how brilliant we've been on, on, on breaking narrative. Now, the reason for that is we have a huge, huge problem is we're not allowed to lie. If I could tell you, you could get 350 billions daily back on your NHS, of course I could convince you. If I could tell you that I can fix all problems of the world by just reducing your contribution to the EU budget, then of course I'd get your attention. And so we, we always get into two scenarios. Either we're the boring professors that explain, saying, well, actually, your contribution is slightly less than 2%, but you get 1% back, meaning that what do you get for 1% of your budget? You lost me already and I understand. Or we, we, we have to, either we explain or we go into the narratives or the other ones. So there is no easy solution. Um, but I think where the midway is, again, is that you don't have to explain everything at the first contact in detail. And you can start by s listening what bothers individuals, what you get at home with your friends, what concerns them, to acknowledge the problem is step one, and then at the second stage, explain what your plans are. But so we don't have that many solutions. I, I remember I once had to do the exercise. I remember once I was very good, which was a, a former Belgian prime minister, Guy Verhofstadt, which at one point there was this huge rant by the Eurosceptics about the budget. And he stood up and he said, you know what, uh, you are right, we are wasting money. But it was a bit like, uh, we're wasting money on your salary. Uh, and so you see that humor is something that, uh, that can work. Uh, uh, still respectful. Um, but that is, I think, the challenge we face versus those who can offer very, very easy solutions that unfortunately don't work. But uh, uh, it, it, it takes effort. It requires listening. And it requires um, for that, to... to, to explain, but, but uh, not in a professorial, academic way. We can see that communication expert mm. side of you coming out uh, while answering this question. Uh, but you also know that uh, as an expert, there's a lot of role that the media plays and also the a project like Party Party mm. and our readers and also the citizens. So uh, parties can only do as much, but they get sometimes a lot of blame for mm. things that are not communicated properly. But if you could give that message to our readers, for, the, for example, uh, and the general public who are not a Eurosceptic, mm. what would be something that would help you communicate these things easier from their side? How can they make your life easier? Yeah. The, the, the key is information, is to, is to stay interested. You don't have to like it. You don't have to agree. It's even better if you disagree. We love debate. But you cannot block off um, what your government does in Brussels will impact you. What your elected parliamentarians in Brussels will vote for will impact you. And no, it's not only the cheap flights, it's not the common charger, it's not only the peace projects we develop. It is much more than that that affects you. And I would like to quote an example that happened last week in Sweden. In Sweden, there was all over the news that EU now forbids you to have fires in your garden, to burn your leaves in the garden. And there, I really want to congratulate two of our members of parliament, Emma Wiesner and, and, and Abir, that really went then to the media saying, uh, guys, can you please double check your sources? Because yes, there's an EU directive, but the thing of saying you cannot burn is actually a national regulation. And so they took, they built their campaign on just correcting myth, correcting facts. And, and so it has three effects. One is they stood up for the EU. Two, they actually reviewed the law at national level uh, in Sweden. 
and three, we, they created the sentiment that you don't have to systematically just believe directly what's in the media, that you can have a critical mind, that you can question uh, 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 some authority. And I think that is a very recent, very concrete and very good example of what one can do to, to, to sometimes stand up for, for the EU. That is really a good example because what I conclude from that is that all of us, parties, media, politicians, uh, we have the responsibility to first tell the truth, mm. to fact check, and to keep the people engaged and interested. And on that note, I would actually want to ask you kind of a, a personal question mm. uh, to make this interview even more interesting uh, for the end. And the question is, what do you love the most about your job? What keeps you going? And if you would to convince someone to have the ambition to uh. become secretary general, uh -huh. for example, one of your daughters, especially, right. you know, women in uh, aspiring to leadership positions, what would you say is the best thing about the job? It's really working with an international crowd that are passionate people that are, in our case, still quite, quite young, dynamic, and that are there because they want to change. And, and I could say that, contrario, there's one thing I will never want to do, is work only with Belgians, only with Swedes, only with Germans. So this exchange you get uh, uh, is really what motivates me. And what I really, really like is getting two European people that don't really know each other, but to find that the farmer from Portugal and a politician from Santa Partiet in, in Sweden or from Keskusta in Finland, that they have some things that unites them and that this umbrella of defending liberties, defending LGBTIQ plus rights, women's rights, that all unites them and it's very nice to watch these synergies. So in short, the answer to your question is it's this international cooperation with all these young, great, dynamic people that are the other party. Sounds amazing. Sounds like you are witnessing bridges being built every single day yes. uh, in front of your eyes. And it's, it sounds amazing and exciting. Diderik, uh, thank you so much for having us. Um, I hope uh, that uh, your campaign will go well and that the Liberals will achieve the result they want and stay an important force in European politics as they are now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Party Party. Cheers.